Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Mr. Eric Soy from Black Swamp Percussion. Eric, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks a lot. Appreciate being on it. Yeah. So uh, Black Swamp, you are the founder and president. Uh, you guys are located yeah. in Holland, Michigan, which I have been to. Very cool huh. little town. This is interesting because um, Black Swamp is very well known for um, orchestral and band instruments. You guys yes. are very, very well known for that of a high quality tambourines, snares, all kinds of things, which we'll learn about shortly. So um, I guess let's start, Eric, with why don't you just take us back to 1994 I believe, because I'm, I'm looking at your very cool, um, it says an incomplete history of Black Swamp Percussion on your <laughs> yeah. website, which is yeah. funny. Uh, so just take us back to the beginning, and uh, how did the company start? So my background is as a drummer, you know, started in band like a lot of us do. So that was in junior high when I started. One of my hobbies has always been tinkering with this and that, putting stuff together, taking it apart. Uh, and my dad had a really nice workshop with a lot of different stuff. So, so, you know, I would repair things. I would repair drums. Uh, my first real drum set was a beat up piece of junk. I think they were Slingerland shells cause they had Slingerland lugs, hmm. but it was completely trashed and we completely yeah. redid it in Neil Pert Tama red. Cause <laughs> that was my guy. Yeah. Uh, so, and that just, that kind of continued on. I ended up going to Bowling Green State University for percussion. And while I kind of meandered more into the concert and orchestral world, uh, I still played drum set a lot, uh, you know, bands in high school and that type of thing. Um, so that was my kind of focus in college. And when I was in college, I still would tinker and do stuff and make little do little projects um so i so i got my bachelor's met my wife who's from holland i'm actually from near cleveland in ohio we moved back to holland for a few years and then we went back for our masters uh still along the time i still tinkered uh, in that two-year period uh, before we went back for our masters, I, I built a marimba, a four and a half octave marimba. Wow! I took I took four octaves off of an old Deegan marimba, and I searched around for rosewood, and I got I got some rosewood for the extra bars, and uh, had uh, Have you ever you've heard of Gilberto, right? Century Mallet Service in Chicago. I have not. He worked for Deegan. For a long time, Deegan sold to Yamaha. He was still in the old Deegan factory in Chicago, but did a lot of mallet restoration. So I got I got bars finished by him, and I made the whole marimba, and it was it was it was quite a project uh, to do. Uh, so then I we went back for our masters, and my master's degree is actually in ethnomusicology, nice. so s study of music and other cultures, and. Yep. Spent some time in, in Indonesia, spent some time in Africa, uh, in Ghana, uh, and all the, all the while still playing some drum sets, still doing gigs, orchestral gigs, driving all over like a lot of us all do. Um, and so all the while just still building. So we get done with grad school. My wife gets a teaching job and I taught a little bit at the university after that, started gigging. All the while, I'd been messing around, still building stuff. Um, so then I started making bamboo-handled timpani mallets. Hmm. Uh, hardly uh, A lot of professionals use that type of timpani mallet because it just feels really good. And not many people did it. So I said, hey, what the heck, I'll just try, make some. Uh, drove off. To, I would get the bamboo from a nursery supply uh, hmm. store. So I would drive two hours, get this gigantic bundle, take it back to our little rented house uh, and sort through all the bamboo. And so I just started making stuff. Then people are like, Hey, can I buy some? Oh, sure. I guess so. And uh, over the months and then the years and just sort of off and running. And it, so it all came out of a hobby, a lifelong hobby. I never really set out to make it a business. I didn't really know what I was doing. 
yeah. figuring it all out as I would. I mean, I was just a player. Uh, th- yeah. I was a player, wasn't a business guy uh, or anything yeah, that, like that. That seems like that's like a classic business story. And I, I can't I got I can't remember the details, okay. but going back to like the Vic Firth episode and things like that, it was like people who just do something on their own and then it catches on. Um, or even I know like the big fat snare drum story is similar where they just start making them and then people like it and they want one and they want one. Yeah. Pretty natural. And I think the passion comes through. Uh, and, and people can tell that it's made by a percussionist for percussionists kind of deal. Yeah, that, that's a big, that's a big thing. Um, I think one of the reasons that we are successful in a very kind of weird niche space in orchestral percussion is because I'm an orchestral percussionist and, uh, you know, I played, you know, forever. I played in the Grand Rapids symphony for 14 years, uh, after we moved back to Holland and a lot of the products come out of, I'm very particular with craft and building and quality. And I would see things and I would say, that's not very well done. I can do it better. Uh, kind of some hubris there, right? <laughs> or I would see, I would have a personal playing situation where I would say, I, I need to solve this problem and there's nothing to solve the problem. And then I start working on it and create a product and that's how over the years we've just introduced product after product you know some things are not rocket science like wood blocks it, it's yeah. trickier to do some of these things than what it seems as far as getting them to sound to sound good uh, like triangles it was a very difficult project uh, but it seems very simple but it's not with metals and plating and tempering and heat treating uh and all that yeah all that kind of stuff i mean this is all stuff that like i I think it's really cool to have you on here because this is stuff that um you really don't appreciate how difficult something is until you uh you know are more in that world and you hear from people like you so it makes perfect sense um now let me ask you this before we go on when you started and it kind of you know you kind of fell into being a business owner uh, was there a lot of competition in the, I, I guess I, I would consider you like a boutique brand mm. or oh, yeah. boutique brand. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, was there a lot of competition in that field or, or who, who were your big major competitors at, in this, in the beginning? Uh, as far as more professional quality things there, there were some, uh, players, you know, players that were professionals that made timpani bamboo mm-hmm. timpani mouth just on the side as a hobby but they okay. sold sold things um, um there was a uh, grover pro percussion in the tambourine professional tambourine world a lot of the good professional small tambourine makers were kind of gone they had done it on the side um sure. i don't know if you've ever heard of harlan percussion no yeah he made some great tambourines uh, then stopped doing it for a while. Um, he was off into media and he was an executive and now he's back, back in it. But guys like that, at that point, it's not like I was going up against, uh, the big guys like we are now because, cause they've uh-huh. got, Oh, Oh, we should get into this. Which would be, and you don't even have to say them, but like, like it seems like most of the big Japanese and American brands, it seems like a lot of them have a a market like this, uh, like you said, because it's like there's there's opportunity, and it's probably a lot easier for them to just pivot a little bit and change a couple things, and they have the tooling than it is for you know small guys. Uh, right, right, and they they for the most part stayed out of the small percussion. Well, we we make uh, a lot of tambourines, we make a lot of drums, uh, but we, we sell a lot of wood blocks. Uh, we sell a lot of castanets. There's just other stuff. Some of them have dipped their toe in, kind of borrowed a few ideas, wink, wink, if you know what I'm saying. And uh, we just do it better. I think we do it better because we're in that world. We've been yeah. in that world. That's what we concentrate on. It's not just, hey, we should, we should do this because we can maybe sell stuff our focus is to make a quality product that solves a problem and helps people make better music that's that's where it starts it's got to make money of course and all that 
But that's really not where it starts. We're not, you know, who's getting rich <laughs> in the orchestral <laughs> percussion world? I don't know. <laughs> no, but that's so true where you, you're you starting at a good place of, of this is a problem that should be solved or we can make this better. Uh, if people buy it, great. And then that lets you make more things and you have yeah. a business and you can like, you know, pay salaries and stuff like that. Sure. Um, before we continue on the timeline, I want to ask a quick question about maybe I'm really interested in your the tambourines, because I think tambourines are one of those things where they are, you know, I think I've played a bunch of different tambourines and I think most drummers of any style have played them, you know, all the different kinds and styles. And you, you can tell there's a difference between brands and plastic and, and wood and, yeah. and, you know, metals. Can you just maybe give us a little bit of uh, your perspective on what makes like, because you, you, I'm sure, make some of the finest tambourines that can be, you know, bought. What what makes a really, really good special tambourine? Uh, well, going back when I, uh, do, do you remember Lone Star Percussion? Yeah, and I've seen them still at, you know, drum shows and stuff like that. Yeah, well... Two owners ago, the, the original owner, he had this pamphlet and he called it not a catalog, he called it his price list. And that it was him and Steve Weiss music mm -hmm. uh, in Philadelphia. And I would just page, you know, like the modern drummers, you would just memorize every page of every issue. Uh, that's what I did with catalogs. And I would go, hmm, what, what can I make? What can I do? So, I don't even know where I came up with the idea of making tambourines, but I had no idea what a tambourine was supposed to sound like. I don't know. What's a tambourine supposed to sound like? I don't know. Um, I know I wanted to make it out, it out of a steam bent shell, not, not a ply shell. So I had to learn how to steam bend wood. You have to learn how to make it round. So there's a lot of, uh, of just the technical aspect, what kind of head do you use? I don't know. Buy different kinds of heads, uh, skin heads, try those. And then the big thing, of course, is the jingle material and how you process it. So it was just a matter of experimentation, trying this and trying that. I got lucky um, with some things that, that I tried and I went, wow, okay, that is pretty good. I think... Yeah. Um, and then what I did is I, I went and found out uh, the, the contact information for big players uh, in the Chicago Symphony, uh, Jim Ross. He's been in Chicago Symphony. Uh, I don't remember how I got in contact with him, but I said, hey, I'm, making, I'm, I'm Mr. Nobody. You have no idea who I am, but I'm making these tambourines. I'll send you some. Would you tell me what you think? And so I did that with a number of players. Uh, name players and they're all just super nice and helpful and gracious and honest which is what i needed um mm. and so i would send them away and they would you know tell me what they like what they're looking for uh, a lot of it was what they were looking for was not being offered or had in the past but no not no more uh solid Steam bent shells sound way better than ply shells. Um, at the Percussive Art Society one year, Chris Lamb, who was principal of New York Philharmonic, was walking somewhere, and I recognized him, and I literally chased him down. And I said, Mr. Lamb, Mr. Lamb, can I talk to you for a minute? And I had my tambourine, and uh, Chris Lamb is very into product development. He's worked with a lot of companies, works with Mapex now on their drums. But he said, yeah, send me some. So I sent him some and he gave me comments. I made tweaks. I sent him some more. He goes, that's good. You got to do this. It's got to sound like this. So that's what I did wow. with various players. Smart. So that's how, the, that's how the tambourine came along. And as I went through that, I started to learn what they wanted. I'm not a name player. I'm good. I'm, you know. I'm good. Of course. I'm sure but you I, are. Of course you I'm are. I'm not, you know, I played in a C level orchestra and I think I did okay for, <laughs> but I, yeah, I'm not, yeah. I mean, th these guys that play in the big orchestras, they are shockingly good. When you sure. really see what they can do, it makes people like me stand back and go, 
<laughs> I, you know, they're there's on such a reason. Different... Yes. Yeah, there's a reason they're there. There's yeah. a reason. Just like any, <laughs> any musician. Totally. Yeah. Uh, maybe I can anticipate a, a question as to what is the difference between an orchestral and like a rhythm tech, I'm not put down, yeah. rhythm tech, but a rock tambourine, the mind. No, exactly. That's my background is in those of like, you're in a recording studio and you've got one and you're going to hit some tambourine. You do, you know, we're almost done. Let's do a track of tambourine. Okay. Or let's hit it on the, the, the hi-hat or on the two and four. What is the difference? Well, the shell, a solid wood shell is not going to be as kind uh, or as receptive to abuse as one of the plastic shell tambourines. It's, it, and there's a sound difference as far as the body and the warmth that plastic just does not do does just doesn't do and um, especially with the typo we use ash and cherry and why well i started using ash because it was one of it's one of the easiest woods to bend but it happened to sound really good so that's why we you know have made so many tambourines out of solid ash so there's the shell uh and there's the head obviously Mm -hmm. orchestral tambourines have a head because you need to have a, a surface to do uh, thumb rolls, which is for those out there that aren't familiar. Some people have enough grip on their thumb. Some people like me use beeswax. And basically your thumb bounces along the head quickly and gives you an extended thumb roll type of, uh, type of sound. So you have to be able to do that. And it's partly the aesthetic of having the head be part of the sound. Uh, one one thing that Chris Lamb said to me early on in his preference is there needs to be a balance between the jingle sound and the head sound. But you'll find some orchestral players, they dampen the head as much as possible. So just, and there's, so there's different schools from Europe to the East Coast, to the Midwest, to the West Coast all kind of have their own specific sound concepts. Uh, sure. I feel like there's probably a whole world of like how to really actually play the tambourine like this in this, uh, you know, arena of like big yeah. dog orchestral stuff, as opposed to kind of grabbing it near, a, you know, set up a mic, play it for the track, you mute a little bit, but there has to be a whole world of style well, and technique that I have no clue about. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, the orchestral, Western music orchestral players. Uh, I'm a fairly good tambourine player, but I am nothing like some of these true super percussion artists that are at the top of the game. And mm. then you have the Middle East uh, players like the Rick. I mean, that's just a whole nother world uh, of sure. tambourine playing. So it, it's a deceptively simple instrument, but it's, it's bread and butter across the world as far as, as far as playing. And then with and then with the jingles, uh, on a rock jingle, a, a rock and roll tambourine, the jingle tends to be the same shape, the same material, and unhammered. And what what that means is that uh, I should say undistorted. That might be a better term, but hammering mm. distorts it. Uh, so on a rock tambourine, all the jingles are the same pitch, so they all sound the same. And what that makes is a very kind of carrot sound. You know, it's kind of a very narrow ching sound, which is totally appropriate for what they're used for. Totally appropriate Uh, on a tambourine. And this is something I learned from Chris Lamb. I learned a lot from Chris Lamb. He said, jingle sets are like a little pair of crash cymbals. And in orchestral crash cymbals, they're different. They have to be a different pitch. Otherwise, they sound like that narrow thing. So you have different yeah. pitches and they meld to create kind of a bigger, fuller sound. So huh. so you distort the jingle. We did by hammering them. And so you create jingles. If you take the jingles out of one of our tambourines, take four jingles, you drop them on a table. They'll all be kind of a different pitch. So when all that mixes up, it creates kind of a bigger this instead of that. Yeah. 
because the two sounds might, I mean, if it's like a, I don't think it's a phase thing, but two identical sounds kind of cancel each other out a little bit and kind of close off because they're too similar. But I guess if you have different ones, they sort of dissipate differently. Right. And and it's all experimentation and me learning and me getting feedback of people saying, yeah, this sounds good. I'm like, okay, I'll do more of that. Or this is what I'll aim for. Uh, but wow. still, our tambourines sound very different than a Grover, which, like snare drums, people own a lot of different types of tambourines, brands, brands of um, snare drums, brands of triangles. You know, it's a whole arsenal, just like any yeah. any other percussive world. Um, yeah, we like our gear. Yeah, <laughs> different. yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. different toys. Does anyone ever take the orchestral tambourine and use it in like recording studio worlds for like, you know, your modern like pop music? Would that yeah. work that way? Uh, yeah, we, we do. Um, Elton John's percussionist uses some of our tambourines. Cool. Uh, Trey Cool does. Um, nice. And some other bands here and there. It's not, you know, it's not a big portion Mostly it's custom stuff we do for people sure. because they, they know our tambourines uh, just because we're well known for tambourines and they want something and they like them. We're like, great. Yeah. You know, we've, we've never really made a push into um, a studio specific, although lots of people use them in the studio or a drum set specific, although they're, you know, people that keep them next to them or put them upside down on the floor, Tom, things like that. But uh, we're just busy enough. (laughs) We're busy (laughs) enough with what we have going already. Sure. Yeah. And successful because it's it's clearly working. Um, I remember in my studio days, which I don't really do as much anymore, but it would be there was a a vintage wooden Ludwig tambourine that was the go to that like you'd try all the other ones and it was like, you know, you try the newer um, whatever brand and it would yeah. be plastic and there'd be, you know, a different one. And in, uh, for some odd reason, and it, it didn't have a head on it. It was just an open, mm-hmm. I'm sure there's a term for that. Open, you know, whatever headless, uh, yeah, headless, uh, headless. That's mm-hmm. good. That makes sense. <laughs> a headless. Uh, and it was just, you know, in the room, it didn't sound, it almost sounded like some, some jingles were missing or something. It wasn't perfect, but then you listen to it with the playback and it was like, that's the one. Yeah, there's something about. I guess it might have been the wood, or just. Uh, I've also heard. Uh, I think the band King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. I believe they always talked about uh, the the wooden Ludwig tambourines classically being being kind of a go to for studios. Yeah, they're they're on so many Motown hits. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's an iconic tambourine. It's kind of the sleeper, right? People don't really realize. Well, of course, Ludwig made seems like millions of everything they made. Uh, yeah. And actually, I have one of the, I have two Ludwig's hanging right over there. You can't see it. I have, cool. I call it my, I call it my tambourine tree. I've got all these vintage <laughs> tambourines kind of hanging down from my, from my uh, awesome ceiling. But I have an interesting story about the Ludwig, the good Ludwig tambourines, which are not the ones in the eighties because they're just different. But you know, Jim Catalano from Ludwig, of course, right. Yep. And he told me that he went to the dumpster with a giant push cart full of those jingles and pushed them into the dumpster. That had to be loud. <laughs> and one of the saddest things ever. Of course. Jeez. Uh, Cause some of just those jingles, the jingles. Just, just the jingles. jingles. Yeah. Wow. Cause metal composition changes over time. Jingles change over time. We have uh, just like any, any symbol you use, crash symbols, drum set symbols, ride, hi-hats, pairs for concert, they you play them in and they sound a little bit different as time moves on. They will sound different even if you don't touch them. They'll just kind of work their way in and, uh, you know, all the little molecules do whatever they do. But it's the exact same way uh, with a tambourine because we'll have people occasionally they'll say hey i just bought um td1 our best-selling one uh and it doesn't sound anything like my the one that's two years old and then Mm -hmm. we have to 
try to explain to them how it's not going to be until it gets played in or just has some time. Yeah. Uh, and that's always a challenge because you don't want to make a customer feel like you don't want to talk down to them. You just kind of want no. it or, or sound like you're making an excuse. You want to be honest yeah. and straightforward. This is just the way it is. Symbols are like that too, where yeah. over time they, you mm-hmm. know, even, you know, fingerprints and little things change the sound and, yeah. um, God, I'm looking at your tambourines on your website. I mean, they are, you can tell they're, they're special. Um, this might be a weird question, but, and this could lead to a whole nother long conversation, I'm sure. But do you like when you're in an orchestra situation, how does it work with like miking something like this? Like, do you, does, does the, the percussionist in their little area there typically have one mic that they're going near with a tambourine or how does that typically work to get it out in this huge theater to make it, you know, sound as best as it can. How does that work? Yeah. uh, uh, In a typical orchestra hall for a typical classical concert, you're not mic'd. Nothing is mic'd except for maybe if there's a soloist, but even in a typical classical concert, uh, a piano concerto piano, the piano is not mic'd. Soloists are not mic'd. Be our violinists, not mic'd. No one's, no one's mic'd. So it's all mixed. Got it. It's all mixed by the conductor at the front. That's who does the mix. But a good hall will will take that sound out. And you know, certain halls in America are known for being they have this personality or that personality. We played at uh, Carnegie Hall once, uh, and everyone's heard of Carnegie Hall. And when we played there, it was an aha moment that we all went, "Oh, we." Now we understand why this is one of the most famous halls in the world, because you could hear everybody everywhere. Certain halls you'd go into, oh, man, I can't hear the basses, and I and I play with them, and I need to hear them, or I don't I don't hear this part. But in Carnegie, you hear everything. Um, so to go back to your question, a pops concert, which would have a singer that's doing Broadway, or you know, you know more music that's not classical, maybe more modern music that has orchestra backup, then they'll use mics. Sometimes, sometimes Uh, our outdoor concerts that we did in a big shell at a ski area. So we did it at the bottom of the ski area, the the hill and everybody sat on the slope, but that was, that was totally uh, mic'd. Everybody was mic'd. And yes, uh, the sound guy whose name was dancer, who uh, did sound for rock bands for years and years and years. Uh, I, th- I think he might have done sound for Ted Nugent or something. Nice. But yeah, he was, he, he did kind of major guy. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yes, I, playing up to the mic. Yes. Yeah, sometimes he would say, you know, play that up near the mic. Okay. But for the most part, it, it was all uh, uh, unmiked. Um, and we didn't really have to play to the mic. He did all that. Everything was usually, we just did what we usually do. He adjusted the mic or you know, him or whoever else was doing the sound would we'll just do it back there. So we didn't really have yeah. to do anything different. Okay. I had no idea. And I'm glad, you know, I'll ask the dumb question. So someone out there now <laughs> knows. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, so the next time I'm at a drum show and I see you guys, I'm going to play your tambourines just to get a different feel for it and see what that is actually like. Cause you know, um, it's worth checking out if you're used to just like you said, rhythm tech or these other brands, which are in guitar centers and stuff, which are really good for what you're doing Mm -hmm. and you mount it on your drum set and you're playing it with a stick or something like that. Everything has its place, but, um, this is very different. So, all right, let's keep going down on your, on your timeline here. So you were, you were making, uh bamboo sticks you were making tambourines castanets when did you get into snare drums uh snare drums started in maybe 1999 98 99 because i mean i give our beginning date as january 1 1995 Uh, that's not that's just a some kind of hard beginning where it it sort of had been growing because before that and even in 95 i was still thinking is this a business i don't know i'm selling stuff does that mean i don't know and just kind of yeah. still gigging yeah. you know still gigging a lot and uh, then we moved we moved back uh we got we were having our first kid and my wife 
was a uh, rift reduction in force from her teaching job pregnant and we're like you know there's no reason for us to be in in adrian michigan where we had you know only the people we had met in the two years you know let's go back to holland it's great it's a great place to live um yeah it's it's a bit nothing's open on sunday you can neighbors would look out of their windows if you were mowing your lawn on sunday so we yeah. moved in 97 my wife's brother's friend had a a cabinet shop and they had a little space so i moved in there and you know a couple year and a half for two years i started messing with snare drums and a lot of trial and error and failure and trying this and uh I, I made some snare drums and said i don't know i just don't know if i know what i'm doing so i put them and i'm like uh, you know i don't even know if they sound very good put them on the shelf. So kind of put that aside and still concentrated on the other stuff. Uh, and then got that, then got back to it uh, back then in the orchestral snare world, where there's a, a lot of similarities between drum set drums uh, and orchestral drums. But the, the big differences would be um, cable snares, which mimic the old gut snares. Typically the, the heads, are much thinner than a drum set type snare and the die cast hoops. Most orchestral players use die cast because it gives more of a distinct marcato sound because if you're, if you're playing four stroke roughs or very quiet things that need to be very distinct, a triple flange hoop just is too fat. It just sounds too, sure. too wide. It's too wide of a sound. I call it. So there are those, uh, things and th and there there were people players uh fred hinger played in philadelphia uh very famous timpanist and teacher he made some drums that were very very i mean they're very sought after still and there were a couple other people making orchestral drums here and there and yeah i just started started messing with stuff and uh, and i mean at in the early years when the big people were not involved, the, the big players were not involved. Uh, uh, we, we would take, we would take 25 snares to, to percussive art society and they would be gone by noon the first day. Jeez. Wow. Yeah, because wow. there was really nothing available. It's a little different now, but we still very much hold our own against the biggest drum companies in the world. Yeah, we are. Is we are this, you know, and <laughs> as hey, as long as we're in the conversation, you know, and we very much are, um, yes. you know, we will never sell as many drums as some of these big companies. Not going to happen. They've got the infrastructure. They they have more people on their janitorial staff for the offices <laughs> than we have total here. But that's what makes it special and and what makes you guys unique. But I mean, uh, I'm sure you do, but you should feel very proud for starting this and be like, is this a business? You know, I guess it is <laughs> to getting to that point where you're being talked about, I'm sure, in like boardrooms and probably I don't want to say being copied, but you're being looked at as an innovator and they're, you know, um, kind of a, a taste maker in your scene. Yeah. Should feel very proud of that. Yeah, That's appreciate huge. that. Appreciate yeah. that. We we work really hard at uh, being that. I mean, we're a small company, and like any any world, it's it's a lot of relationships. So in our world, you know, here's the drum set world, and here's the concert percussion world. So we, you know, we all know each other pretty much, yeah. and so you just develop those relationships, and you listen to each other. And as a company, that's the big thing. What do yeah. they want? I am not principal percussionist of the Chicago Symphony. You know, I am. I, that will never be in my future. <laughs> so, what do they want? Because they're the ones that are the world famous orchestras. So, that's always been the focus. What What do players want to hear? They They do that for the most part. Some of some people like Tom Freer, who's in Cleveland, timpanist in Cleveland Orchestra. He's got both ends, whereas he is a brilliant player and he's a brilliant designer of instruments. And I worked with him on some stuff 
uh, for some years um, also. But uh, I'm good at th the design, machinery, process, sourcing, repeatability. Yeah. Uh, production, even though we, we are production, I call us more pr custom production. Yeah, but you want each one to be the same. You, if they buy five of them, you don't want one to be like, "Whoa, what happened to that one?" Right. Yeah, we we do custom. We we do a sure. fair amount of custom, but that's kind of not our focus because th th there's a lot of problems with that. Once you know, once you get to a certain point in the business, you know, you got to feed the machine. You got to feed the overhead. You got to feed the benefits. You got to feed the pay. And I'm fine with that. We still do enough stuff custom that's still interesting. But totally, it, yeah. When I mean, we're not huge, but you know, I've got a nice size facility, and I got people that work for me. You got to pay the bills, and uh, yeah. you you need bread and butter. To yeah. you need bread and butter to make the jelly. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. No, that's that makes perfect sense. And you've got. Uh, uh, diff you've got a nice selection. What is it? Four, five, six, seven or so lines of snare drums. Um, maybe what is the most popular? That's like your, you, you know, in your world that that you are. This is what everyone the go to for a lot of people when they look when they think Black Swamp. Yeah, our most popular snare is a. Well, this is now it's a five inch, uh, the multisonic system, um, and. Uh, five by 14 or 14 by five uh, mm -hmm. with die cast and we have it in two different colors and that's that's the big bread and butter snare drum nice and yeah. then we have as you can see we have solid shells we have titanium um you know in the past we've done brass we've done bronze um you know we've done, done aluminum we've done a, tried a lot of different things and that's not bread and butter, but it makes it interesting for us. And I, and we yeah. all want, we want stuff to be interesting and not, we just don't want to come in here and stamp out a million of the same widgets, not interesting, sure. not what I want to do. So the bread and butter helps pay for some of this other stuff that we still sell. I mean, the titanium drums are expensive, but yeah, they sound unique. Uh, they, they sound, they have a particular sound that really works for, for people, for certain situations. We do a lot of solid shells of different exotics, a lot of different stuff that, um, no one had ever really made drum, sh drum shells out of before, like Bacote. No one had ever done that, uh, shell material, that, that wood until I started doing it. Very hard to bend shells. Well, and that, that gets yeah. to the question about making the shells, but I'm just looking around kind of clicking while we're talking. And these are not like astronomically priced snare drums by any means. This is a very specific, uh, thing, which I think also it's in line with the price of like other high end snare drums in the drum set world. So this mm -hmm. is, uh, I didn't even know what to expect, but they're very comparable to like, you know, another nice pro drum, but, um, Shell construction. How, do, I mean, are you guys doing all the? Are you building the shells in shop, or is everything done there? No, and, and that's one thing I want to preface this. Um, we have a lot of when we consider them partners, people that do stuff that do it well because that's what they do. And uh, it bothers me a little bit when a company will give the impression that they do this and they do that. When I full well know. You do not do that. My tact has always been, yeah, no, we do not make the ply shells. Keller does. Some things that we don't make, I will say we source this elsewhere. I won't tell you who it is. Uh, but Yeah, totally so, fine. You know, Keller, <laughs> for all the bashing, the Keller bashing that goes on, they make a good Keller's shell. Keller's great. Oh, they my God. And that's that comes up a lot on this show where – more times than not, and people are probably sick of hearing it because it comes up so much of, of people defending, saying, listen, Keller's awesome. It's custom design. It's not just you're not pulling one off the shelf and screwing some lugs on it. It's specific formulas and stuff. So, no, I think that's uh, yeah. I like the way you put that where, you know, be proud. Yeah, they're very they're consistent. Their veneers are very good. Um, 
uh, yeah, I, I, I don't like see the, the Keller bashing. Uh, you know, it's funny when DW stopped using Keller uh, and then it became, oh, this is a <laughs> Keller era DW. <laughs> <laughs> which everyone's like those are great <laughs> uh, yeah ex- exactly you know that yeah uh, yeah well all right that's that's interesting and i totally understand and 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 that's um a very fair point but it's the construction and putting it together and getting it all dialed in and everything which is hugely important um now am i mistaken do you guys is the dynamics snare is that a drum set more of a typical drum set snare drum yeah so yeah so that that was kind of a pet project that I started many years ago. And, um, you know, it shares a lot of the same components and, you know, we're not really known for those, but they're great drums and the people that like them really like them. Um, but yeah, we use the same, the same lugs. Uh, we do do put different heads on there, more drum set appropriate heads and triple flange hoops, uh, curly wires, not cable, obviously. Although surprising the amount of drum set players that want cable. So sometimes I got to kind of steer their expectations as to, you know, this is going to be drier than what you're expecting. And it's going to be a more marcato sound than what you're expecting. It's not going to be this, you know, Def Leppard <laughs> type of sound, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's interesting. Um, that people want that and you never know unless you talk to someone like you and you experiment and uh it's pretty cool i think uh from seeing your guys booth again i need to experiment more but um next year when i'm back more of the drum shows after the madness of having a baby um i will absolutely come and just experiment more and um you know mess around because it's cool how many different little things you can have in our in our world you know yeah oh yeah i'm i i have so much stuff that i've bought just because I thought it was cool and I've used it once, but I still like it. <laughs> it's yeah. still fun to just have this little gizmo. I have a total oh, yeah. gizmo. I'm a total gizmo freak. I am completely yeah. in love with gizmos. So there's so many clever people out there uh, making really interesting things uh, yeah. or coming up with, you mentioned Big Fat Snare Drum. Who the fuck? I mean, part of that's not really a new idea because people were cutting out sure. rings uh, before that, but wow, you know, he took it to the next level and added layers of interest uh, beyond just a basic, oh, you know, Ream O or or, uh, that type type of a product. Adding the gasket and the the weight and yeah. um, But that's like, uh, I mean, similar to what you're doing, where like people people have done this stuff before. They've made triangles, they've made certain things, but you do it a certain way and people like that. And um, and actually, it just makes me think, too, kind of unrelated. Where did the name Black Swamp Percussion come from? What made you think of that? <laughs> well, <laughs> it, okay. First, my name is Soy, S-O-O-Y. 70% of people don't know how to pronounce it correctly. Okay. The second thing is I wasn't a name player. Vic Firth, name player. Mike Balter, he was a regional name player uh broadway shows really good player people kind of don't know that about mike balter really really good mallet player hmm. uh, and, and there's other um alan abel abel triangles uh, a very common orchestral triangle you know he was in the uh, uh philadelphia orchestra so the name black swamp comes from the area around bowling green in toledo area the nickname for that area was called the Great Black Swamp by the Native Americans because it was a big swamp land. And there's all kinds of, there's the Black Swamp Arts Festival, there's Black Swamp Brewery, there's Black Swamp this and that. And it was just sort of a joke. It was just sort of before I, because it wasn't a business. It was just yeah. sort of something I did. And, and for some, anyone that's around Bowling Green, Black Swamp was just sort of colloquial, a name that was common and not weird like it is to most of humanity. <laughs> <laughs> Outside of Bowling Green. I think it's cool. I yeah, think it's so, very cool. So it got to the point where it wasn't defined as the color black and a uh, uh, environmental <laughs> wetlands. Yeah. <laughs> it, it became colloquial with high quality percussion. It became connected with that. And then it just sort of enters the lexicon 
Uh, and yeah, so, so here we are. I mean, I get that question a lot, which is a great question. Uh, I didn't have any better idea <laughs> what it should be. <laughs> and you kind of don't forget it, right? It's kind of, it's not, it's not like awesome percussion or super superior you know, percussion yeah. or it's that, unique. that type of thing. Yeah. All right. Moving on the timeline here. Keep, keep going here. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at your, um, history on your website, it said significant sales growth in 2005 allowed you guys the opportunity to move into a 10,000 square foot manufacturing facility where you are today, right yeah. now, correct? Yeah. Right um, now. That's pretty huge. That had to be a, an accomplishment that you've outgrown what you're, where you were. Yeah. And you had a big, big boy, uh, you know, manufacturing <laughs> oh, <laughs> place. If you only knew any uh, people that have started, they're only people that have started their own business will understand <laughs> the risk and the, oh my gosh, did I do the right thing? <laughs> in, in 1999, I bought my first CNC machine. Uh, it's a five axis machine that anything we make out of wood, it does something to that. Drills holes in mm. snare shells, slots and tambourines. It makes wood blocks. We make our castanets, and candles. So I, I, I didn't know hardly anything about CNCs, and it was, uh, and I'll tell you, in 99, it was, it was $100,000. Oh, my God. Which, yeah. Well, I mean, that's <laughs> a lot of money now, but for my little company. Yeah. And so I got it and went down for training. I basically knew just about nothing, but I'm pretty mechanically inclined, and you know, so that's kind of my one of my love languages and so so we got that and i remember about two months after it was delivered and working with it i said to my wife i said this is the biggest mistake i've made in my life this is this is horrible six months down the road i went julie this is the best decision i ever made in my life that because, happens man yeah, yeah. We can, so i'm on my second one now we couldn't do what we do as consistently with the same quality without this machine. That said, uh, everyone that works here, amazing craftsmen. Uh, yeah. So anyway, that was my first big step. And then that shop I moved into, just a little north of here, little tiny space, outgrew that. I took over a little bit more of their space that they weren't using, outgrew that. They built a bigger, a bigger. I think it was three thousand two uh, something square feet. They built a building on the back of their building, so I moved into there. And then, yeah, uh, it, it's the old uh, renting versus buying. Am I? I'm giving all this money to someone else. Yeah. So I started looking into buildings and needed more room. Because things were just, uh, you know, the the, um, the horse was dragging me around, <laughs> you know, it was taking sure. me for a ride. And uh, so, you know, looking around and and I, I uh, purchased a building. We're in a like a condo complex. So there's a number of businesses all connected to the same uh, complex. But um, so, yeah, it, it's a, another story of. Well, my wife and I bought it. You risk, you put your neck on the line, and six months down the road, this is the biggest mistake I ever made in my life. <laughs> but now it's you know my, my my wife even said this that you know as far as you know it's an asset. Totally. And and, and she she said, yeah that, that was a really good decision. I didn't know what I was doing. I sort of still don't know yeah. what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you're like, but, I feel like it's taking you're you're being led by like the universe or whatever. The drum universe is like <laughs> taking yeah. you into these steps, you know, and you're just kind of like stepping through it and it's worked out so far. Yeah, it's uh, making good product consistently serving the customer. Treating people right, working with vendors, all that's hard. Uh, it's not as hard as running the business and keeping it being able to flip that switch on of the lights in the morning. Uh, yeah. yeah. So all that's hard. The rest of it, which is why, you know, you see a lot of businesses crash and burn 
uh, and you see businesses that are growing fast, you think, oh, they're going to they're going to skyrocket through the universe and they burn they crash and burn because it's very you can you can go broke growing too fast. But one of, one of my biggest customers uh, said that to me one time. He said, Eric, be careful. Don't grow too fast. Uh, and he was right because we had just wild growth years. And those are really tough on cash flow uh, unless you get daddy warbucks in here, right? To, to drop a bunch of money. But that wasn't, you know, obviously going to happen. All people see is the products. But for the most part, what you don't see is, uh, you know, the accounting side of it, the, the, the legal side of it, the, you know, just, just the paperwork of, of, state of michigan and the uncle sam yeah. it, it, you know, just, benefits and yeah. yeah yeah trying to figure out what do i pay people what benefits do i offer and it, it's just yeah. yeah it's a big it's a big thing but i have uh i mean my team here unbelievable just so good um so i'm gonna give a shout out tim church he has been with me for 25 years Grown with the business from packing up boxes, and now he heads up to artists, uh, mm. dealers, and, and you know, it's just really, really good. People really like Tim. Yeah. I like you too, Tim. Uh, I've met looking at the website. I think I've met Tim at uh, the drum shows, and super, super nice guy. Everyone yeah. I've met on your team oh. was very nice. Yeah, and then there's a. Uh, uh, I'll go and I'll go and rank of seniority. Jamel Taylor. He moved here from the east side of the state. Uh, Tim knew him from the winter drumline world that they were involved in. And uh, he's been here 16 years and is uh, a juggernaut force of nature with just enthusiasm and skill. Uh, yeah. So, so that's great. He runs the shop. So I don't have to worry about that because he runs all that and it's all, it's all goes smooth. Uh, and then the, the next one down would be a, uh, uh, Kristen, and she's basically our CFO, and she kind of does the big picture financial stuff. She's a CPA, just scary smart. And then there's Eric Peterson, and they call him Eric Jr. <laughs> so they really call him Jr. <laughs> and he grew from a guy that we just hired in the production, and now he he knows how to make pretty much everything, and he can do it really well. That guy can do stuff better than I ever could do because, you know, he, he was a little more focused, but he's just good. He's smart. I'll hire smart over skilled or experienced any day. And that's always paid off. Sure. I've hired experienced people and I've fired experienced people, but smart I people yeah. I want to, I want to keep around. And then Nathan, now he does social media and he does shipping. So he's kind of got a strange job. And he does some other stuff in there, uh, but like any small business, we all wear crazy different amounts of hats. And yep, I've uh, talked to Nathan years ago. Very mm -hmm. nice guy. Very good at what he does. Yeah, and then there's uh, Samuel. He's he's a newer person, and so he's great. Um, yeah, and uh, so it's a really great team. We're we're way smaller than what people think we are because we, uh, as I like to say, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. And so you put out this, you kind of have this bigger presence than what yeah. it's, than what we actually are. Um, and I would never trade machinery for people, but the CNC and the people we can put out a lot more. Um, and I do a lot of machine stuff, special machines for buffing, for sanding, for edges, um, kind of what I do is I build the skill into the machine. So it's like, yeah, it's high quality. It's repeatable. It's consistent. People come in here and we get two, typically two reactions. One is, is man, I thought there would just be a bunch of, uh, pallet racks with boxes from China on it. I'm like, no, we, we make stuff. We make noise and a lot of dust and and then yeah. the other, the other, the other thing people say is, "Wow, this is smaller than I thought." Even though we're not small, you know, they think we're—I don't know how many people they think are here. Well, we've yeah. had we've had more in the past, but my staff's so good, we can just you know, 
it's it's pretty it's pretty well oiled at, at this point. Sure. I've always had that with other brands where even even bigger brands like large, you know, big, big, big brands are like, oh, we actually aren't as big as people think we are employee yeah. number wise. And hmm. I frequently get emails uh, that will say, you know, hey, drum history team or hey, guys. And I'm just like, there's no one else. It is just <laughs> every single thing. Yeah. is just me. Yeah. Which, but I think it's better to give that representation of it being a team effort or it's got to be a bunch of people working at Black Swamp because they do so much work. It's better to do that than yeah. than think like uh, this has to be one person because it's so, yeah. <laughs> you know, the opposite. Um, but which you just hit uh, in 2020, three years ago now, which is weird to say in January, yeah. your 25th anniversary. So you're yeah. now coming up on 30 years. Yeah, that's pretty crazy, man. I mean, you've created your own job and been working for yourself for <laughs> almost 30 years. <laughs> I don't know how to do anything else, so no one better fire me. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's yeah. You know, so twenty twenty three will be twenty eight years, and I go wow that I've I've never really worked. Uh, I mean, other little jobs in college and stuff. Um, in between that and my masters, and I don't count gigs, but I've never had a regular job. I worked for a corporation, and you know you sacrifice certain things. Um, you know, I have, I have plenty of friends. They like working in a big company. Their job is very siloed, yep. which is totally fine. Uh, but they got, you know, they got the good benefits and they got you know better pay. I, I'm, what was that? What it was the movie up where that, where that dog was like squirrel. That's yeah. me. I'm like, <laughs> oh, Hey, something new. Uh, yeah. I want to do something new. Uh, hey, look at that. That's super interesting. Yeah. And, and so starting. It's good. Cause you're the boss, you know? Yeah, yeah. Although a lot of that has been tempered over the years, as you as you integrate a team and you got to work with a team versus I started the thing, I did what I wanted, I did all the stuff because there was no one else to do it. There was no one to tell me no, and and you just kind of throw stuff against the wall and hope it sticks, and and you go forward. But then once you get a team. And there's other stuff going on and it gets a little bit more formalized and uh, you know, kind of have to sure. uh, adapt to that if you want to make it sustainable, right? Yep. And not chaos. Um, and you got people to pay, um, you know, in 28 years, I have never missed a payroll ever, never, ever that's missed huge. a payroll. Uh, so that's, and that's always very number one. Um, yeah. Well, you're priority. You're balancing things correctly and not growing too fast, like your your friend said. And um, all right, awesome, Eric. Well, I feel like we've covered a lot of stuff here. Is there is there anything in the history of Black Swamp that you think I've I've missed, or do we we feel like uh, your history has been represented pretty well? No, no, that's that's great. I, I appreciate it. And you know, sometimes I'm like dragging. It's been 28 years. I'm like. <laughs> When did that happen? What happened then? <laughs> no, it's good. And I'm glad you have your website where I can follow along. But um, so everyone listening, Eric is kind enough. He's going to um, hang out at the end of this. And we're going to do a Patreon bonus episode where I'm going to talk to him about his experience um, with being at the drum shows and, and you know, Percussive Arts Society at PA at PASIC. You guys are always there. Yeah, um, that's a huge part of your business. And I yep. think you, you, you have to be there. And I've learned from doing the my show that good things happen from being at these drum shows like in in every way when you leave you're like that was worth it i'm really glad so if you guys want to hear that we're going to record that after this um go to patreon.com slash drum history podcast and um you can check that out and a bunch of other bonus episodes um so uh eric you want to tell people where they can find you your social media all that stuff as we wrap up sure yeah the the website is uh www.blackswamp.com and then uh, you know we're on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok and it's all sort of variations of Black Swamp Perk or Black Swamp if we could if we could get Black Swamp if it wasn't taken sure. already so yeah we're yeah. Uh, we're on all those uh, the social media things yep. cool all right I will put all the links in the description and uh, you know if if you are in this world of the orchestral percussion or in drum set stuff with your, your dynamic snare, um, then, uh, you know, check it out. I, most people know about you, but if for some odd reason you haven't, um, then be sure to check out black swamp and, uh, 
absolute pleasure talking to you. I'm glad we connected and, um, you know, hope to see you again at, you know, at a drum show soon. And uh, I appreciate you being here. Yeah, thanks a lot. It was great. It was great talking to you. Always been a fan. I've always been a fan. (laughs) Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks, Eric.